This is Spyderco Cali 3 or Calypso 3. This is an older Spyderco design and in some ways it kind of shows it. So the Cali 3 here is a 3 inch long blade, eighth of an inch thick, so 125 thousandths. And this one is made in Seki City, Japan. It doesn't even say Seki City there, it just says Japan. Same factory as all their other Japanese stuff. And this is one of Spyderco's older lines there, Calypso Lime, which used to be extremely popular. Same line, the Dragonfly is basically a tiny version of this. The UK PK is in the same line. <clears throat> and these were quote unquote designed to be an extension of the hand. This is a small EDC size knife. It's made in this forest green G10, which used to be relatively popular. <clears throat> and this particular one, which you can still find in some rare spots, is HAP40 and SUS10. This is a sand my blade with HAP40 on the bottom and a SUS410 jacket on there. When you're doing a sand my like this, there's two reasons that you're going to do it. So you're going to choose a high edge retention steel for the bottom of your blade because you want that edge retention there. You want the actual edge to have high edge retention and occasionally you want, you know, high toughness too. HAP40 is basically, it might be literally, a Japanese analog for Rex 45. So you've got a non-stainless steel here that is going to have, in the case of Rex 45, quite high edge retention and in that case, quite a bit of toughness. And then what you do is you jacket it with a steel that is generally going to be going to be more corrosion resistant and often is going to be a little tougher or will be heat treated softer so that it ends up in practice being tougher. And you get the same sort of effect that you would get with a kitchen knife with a differentially heat treated blade where you know some high end kitchen knives they will treat the spine of the blade at a softer hardness and a lower HRC than the cutting edge. And that way you get more flexible steel at the spine, which makes the whole blade tougher, um, more resistant to fracture or snapping or breaking, while still getting that high hardness that you want for edge retention down at the edge. A sand my, sand my blade like this gets you some of those properties. Then this blade here is what you typically saw in the Cali line, which is really an extended version of Spyderco's leaf shape. You know, if you think about what you see on a PM2 or something like that, I don't have my PM2 with me right now, but you can, uh, you can see how this takes your typical Spyderco leaf and just elongates the whole thing. And then you've also got this stiff choil, this really peaky choil right behind your spidey hole here. Now, what this leads to is, you know, when you're gripping this knife, your thumb sits right there and it's a really secure place to put your thumb. And then you've got a shallow choil with some pretty shallow jimbic here, but it does give you a little bit of grip. And so these knives sort of push you toward doing a pinch grip right behind the blade like this. You'll notice it's very similar to the grip that I celebrated so much on the Dragonfly. <clears throat> the challenge though, and this you know, probably when this blade design started being used, this wasn't as much of a challenge because Spyderco didn't maybe have some of their more modern blade designs, but this tip, you know, I'll bring out my native here. Oops, sorry about that. If I bring out another, th a more modern three inch Spyderco design and a more popular these days Spyderco design, the native. When I grab my native, I'm basically on top of that blade. When I pinch this here, most of my thumb and a lot of my finger is really right in control of the blade. Even this tip here is not really that far from my hands. I feel like I have a lot of control over this blade. It's easy to sneak up. It's easy to pull back. I feel like I have a lot of control over this whole blade. And I feel that as I cut um, with the Natives and the PM2 and that whole Para series, I feel like I don't have to sight the blade, meaning I can just put the blade into the material and it will just cut and I don't have to think about where the edge is once I'm cutting. The Cali has always felt a little awkward in this regard. The Cali 3 less so than the Cali 3.5. <clears throat> but even this one, just the way, the, the distance between this tip and where my hands are 
I get the same sort of feeling that I had with the Native Chief. Now, a lot of people love the Native Chief, so I could be in the minority here, but I feel like toward the tip of this blade, it's always started to get away from me a little bit in use, and I've always felt when I use the Cali 3, or the Cali 3.5, which I've got a separate review coming on, that I have to pay attention to where the edge is, because it just isn't as intuitively where I want it to be as it is in a lot of Spyderco designs. And Spyderco tends to do that very, very well. Um, the PM2, you know, is one of those blades, I say this in every time I mention it, where the edge is just always exactly where you want it to be. This one, that's not quite as much the case. This one, I don't love this blade shape practically. Um, you know, it's got a nice tip. It, it cuts things well, the belly's fine, but the way it's just extended like this, it's never quite felt intuitive to me. And that's unfortunately not the only other thing that I, the only thing that I don't love about this blade. First, the jacket here. One of the things that you'll see anytime you look at these San Mai Seki City Japan blades is their jacket steel is generally quite soft. And you can see the scratches there on the jacket. Some of the scratches up here, some of the scratches down there. You can see those aren't smudges because I can try to wipe them off, they don't wipe off. Those are scratches and mars. And because this jacket material is so soft, it will scuff up pretty much immediately when you start using it. I've only used this for mostly lightweight EDC. I push it a little harder for the sake of testing it out, but I've only used this for pretty light things and still that jacket shows wear almost immediately. You'll see people with jacketed Andellas and Enduros and things like that. This exact same blade combination, which was a cutlery shop exclusive for a little while on the Endura and the Andella, and their blades will look like garbage. I mean, and not even in the way that like a blade with a nice patina, you know, brings out some nice colors, the, the dirt and grime just starts to make it look nice. These just look, <clears throat> they look like they've got fingerprints and smudges on them that never go away. You can see some of them on the spine here in the right light. You know, the idea of a San Mai is really cool, but they've chosen such a soft steel for the jacket that what is overall a pretty classy looking knife package ends up having a blade that scuffs up like crazy very quickly. And the last thing I don't love about this blade is, and I don't know exactly why, but it's the way that they've done this HAP40. So again, HAP40 is very similar to Rex45. Rex45, which, you know, they've got it in the native. I've actually got a native in Rex45. I've had a native chief in Rex45. Rex45 is one of my favorite steels. Um, I've had PM2s in Rex45. Rex45 has always been one of those steels that gets a super toothy, grabby edge and sharpens up to a super, super sharp edge. That has not been my experience with this HAP40. I've tried sharpening this blade multiple times, and I've had this experience with my other HAP40 in Spyderco. And it gets sharp, but you'll hear people talking about a steel that glasses out, meaning it's a steel that will take such a glassy edge that it loses those micro serrations that really make the steel bite into things. And that's the experience I've had with this HAP40. It gets sharp, but unless I sharpen it really abrasively, it will get to a glassy sharpness that doesn't bite into material all that well. And so when I'm using this and I'm cutting stuff, I'll often have to almost saw the knife to get it to initially bite into the material. Once it bites, it will continue cutting nicely because the edge is sharp. But this edge gets so glassy so easily that it tends to have a hard time initially biting into material. And you combine all of these things together, and this ended up being a blade that I didn't enjoy using that much. This is probably more than any other knife in my collection a knife that I have wanted to like so much more than I have actually liked it. And a lot of it has come down to the performance of this blade due to the shape of it, <clears throat> due to the aesthetic characteristics of that jacketing, and due to the performance of this steel there. And you, know, you can see that the jacketing is doing what, you, what it should. 
uh, if you look really closely, you can see the very beginning of rust, or at least a bit of patina in some spots in the unjacketed portion down here. But I just have never loved the performance of this blade. And so every time I'm carrying this knife, I enjoyed carrying it until it's become time to cut something, at which point I've enjoyed having it much less. And that's really a shame because when you look at the handle, the execution is phenomenal. So this is forest, the Forest Green G10, which is a really nice color. They use this in some of their ZDP 189 sprints, and they use it here too. Really nice color, and as Seki City tends to do, the flat scale with the G10 with just a bit of rounding. This almost looks like it was hand sanded all the way around because it's not totally consistent. So it almost looks like somebody hand sanded this whole edge. And it's just a nice rounding off the whole way around that makes it very nice in the hand. This handle by itself is a very nice design that does interact well with this first hump here where this first finger choil is quite generous, and then you've got some pretty aggressive swells here that your three fingers have tons of space to move up and down. This is a three-inch knife that still has plenty of space for my whole hand. Um, pretty dramatic downward swoop, which is typical of the Calypso series. Um, and that, you know, it does fit naturally into the hand. The problem with this handle, though, is how skinny it is with the handle design, not the execution. With the handle design is how skinny it is. When I grab it, it ends up having sort of a gap behind the spine where if I pinch it here, I'm pinching it by this really nice pinch point here. I'm grabbing it, my three fingers are getting under here, but then it doesn't naturally slide into my palm. It wants to sit in my fingers. It wants to sit right at this, right at the base of my fingers here, but when my hand wraps around it, there's a gap right here. And I have to either push it down into my palm, which feels a little unnatural, or keep it up in my fingers, in which case there's nothing really except my palm holding onto the back of this knife. Long story short, when I'm using this, it feels like there's a gap behind the back of the knife. It doesn't ever sit comfortably in my hand. Not a problem under lighter use, which is really what this knife is designed for. But anytime I try to push it heavier, like right now, there's a gap right behind here. You can see when I turn my hand around, there's a gap right there. I'm holding it by the butt and I'm holding it by the pinch point. There's a gap in the handle. And I have to go into some unnatural positions to close that gap. <clears throat> it's just, when I start to push it a little harder, it just doesn't quite sit right in my hand. So that's another issue I've got with the design of this handle. But We'll go back to the execution because the execution continues as we look closer to be excellent. It's a pinned construction all along the backspacer here. And this domed pivot here with the pinned construction looks super classy. And I've handed this knife to a few people and consistently gotten the response. That is a nice looking knife. Go to the backspacer. This backspacer is super flush the whole way down, especially down to the butt here. I mean, these are now, of course, it attracts scratches like crazy, but this is like almost custom maker level of flush for most of this backspacer. The only real visible gap is right at the edge of that, uh, of that back lock there. The boy dent there is nicely carved out. Even the way the, you know, the, the torque screw is bored into that pivot is nice. It's classy. It looks good. Like everything about the execution of this handle is very, very nice. And then the back lock itself depresses nicely. Super smooth action, which you tend to have super smooth action with these steel lined back locks from Seki City. It's smooth the whole way. Now there's a bit of a quirk. The um, spring tension is nowhere close to even through the opening action. It's quite stiff right when you start to open. And then it's almost like the opposite of a half stop. In the middle of this action, there's almost no resistance here. And I can just push it back and forth easily. And then it snaps nicely at the end. But even then, there's not that much resistance right here. So it's really, it's a very uneven back lock. And you get used to it. And again, it's smooth. It's well made. It's well put together. 
it's almost glassy and it can drop shut quite nicely and it's just it's a nicely executed backlock but again the design of the way they put it the spring tension isn't quite even in the way that you'll get you know if i compare something like the native the native it feels nice and smooth and about even with the tension the whole way through and it just ends up being a little more satisfying to use so it's another quirk in a knife that is quite obviously full of them and so you know this is an older knife from spider co's collection and in a lot of these little design details, you sort of see it and you sort of feel it. It's, it's a very nicely made object and it's a knife that I have wanted so hard to like. And on paper, I should like it a lot. Came out at 200 bucks. I mean, it would probably be 300 if it was widely available today. But it's got relatively thin blade sock. It comes down to a pretty solid edge. It's got a great pinch grip right behind the handle. Seki City does a great job on their G10. It's got a nice and smooth backlock. I mean, this should be a knife that I really like. But largely because of that blade performance, and then a little bit because of the design of this handle, when you start to push it harder, it hasn't been a knife that in practice I have loved. And unfortunately, even though I keep giving it a try over and over, I mean, the native is just better. <laughs> and if I get a native in G10, like, this native is a joy to use. This Cali is a bit of a pain to use. And you can dress up a native and get it in a form that's almost as pretty as this Cali. The hardware isn't quite as pretty, but um, the whole package can end up just as pretty with a couple aftermarket mods. So that's where I sort of end up on the Cali 3. It's a very cool knife, but it is a bit of a relic in Spyderco's collection. It probably was exceptional at one point in time um, because, again, that, that execution is great and there are elements of the design that are very cool and that have influenced a lot of Spyderco work that's come since. But it just doesn't quite feel like it stands up to Spyderco's modern catalog and it isn't quite as refined from a design perspective as some of the best of what Spyderco has to offer today. And so if you like the design, there's, and you like the look of it, you like this pinned look with the dome pivot, the, the forest green G10, it's a nice knife. But it just doesn't quite perform at the level that a lot of their best models and best designs do. And so that's where I stand on the Cali 3. Cool knife, not my favorite. I wanted it to be my favorite, but it's just not. Hope that was a good use of your time, and I hope to see you again soon.